Whenever I do the intro to these videos, I try my best to be funny and goofy. But for today's video, I'm going to be serious. Because I would feel a bit tone deaf to start this video with a stupid joke considering today's subject matter. I am having a hard time with this intro due to the delicate nature of what I want to talk about and why I want to bring it up in relation to today's manga I'm going to be reviewing. Today I'm going to be reviewing Onward Towards Our Noble Deaths, which is a World War II narrative told from the perspective of the Japanese army, where you as the audience are supposed to feel sympathetic for the soldiers. Now there is nothing inherently wrong with that in the case of this manga, since the author Shigeru Mizuki shows how the common foot soldiers were at the whims of their commanding officers, and how it was a generally brutal situation they were in. But I feel that it is still important to go into this manga understanding that Japan committed many war crimes during World War II. I feel that, at least in the case of my experience of U.S. public education, we don't focus on Japan's war crimes as much as Germany's for a variety of reasons. Not the least of which is the fact that Germany was committing a mass genocide in Europe. Japan's invasion of Asia was brutal. They used poison gas in China and brutalized the Chinese people. Take the rape of Nanking, for instance. They forced Koreans into hard labor and forced many Korean women into prostitution for the army's pleasure corps. They set up death camps in Manchuria and conducted unimaginable human experiments on prisoners, and much, much more. Now, I'm not saying all this just to bash on Japan and say that we shouldn't feel sympathetic for the soldiers in this manga. Mizuki himself very much understood these facts, that Japan committed these crimes, and even created a manga in 1991, which I briefly mentioned in his biography section, about those atrocities. I just feel that it is important to go into this manga with all of this in mind so as to not come off as ignorant of these issues and presenting this sympathetic view of Japanese soldiers during the war. I also want to acknowledge that all sides during the war committed many horrendous crimes, even the Americans. It's okay to feel sympathetic for the soldiers in this manga. Mizuki himself understood what Japan did during the war and merely presented a story about how the common foot soldiers were also brutalized by the Japanese Imperial Army. Now, let's get into the review. Onwards Towards Our Noble Deaths by Shigeru Mizuki was published in Shukan Gendai in August of 1973 before being published as a book that same year. Now, interestingly enough, the magazine this manga appeared in, Shukan Gendai, actually isn't a manga magazine. It's a general interest magazine containing opinion pieces and essays. The magazine, however, has also published a number of other manga stories besides Onwards, including a number of works from the legendary duo Kazuo Koike and Goseki Kojima, such as Samurai Executioner and... Half of the Assassin. The edition of the manga I read was the 2011 Drawn and Quarterly release, translated by Jocelyn Allen. This edition also came with an afterword, written by Mizuki himself in 1991, as well as explanatory notes for certain moments and references within the manga. The author, Shigeru Mizuki, is a legendary creator in Japan, thanks in part to his large body of work concerning yokai stories. Originally born Shigeru Amura in Osaka in 1922, he was raised in the rural coastal town of Sakaiminato. Growing up, he became fascinated with local folklore, especially horror and yokai stories, which were fueled by his family servant, a woman named Fusa Kajiyama, who Mizuki would later immortalize as Nononba in a manga by the same name. 
These stories he heard growing up would go on to have a major impact on his manga career. As a child, Mizuki showed a great talent for drawing, which was supported by his father and his teachers. His life would dramatically change forever in 1942 when he was drafted into the Imperial Japanese Army and sent to New Britain and Papua New Guinea. Now, it should be noted that fighting for the Japanese Army in the South Pacific was particularly brutal, due in part to supply chain issues, conditions in the jungle, and the prevalence of mosquitoes, which resulted in a large number of soldiers contracting malaria, including Mizuki. This disease would ultimately lead to Mizuki losing his left arm after an American air raid struck the hospital that he was recovering at. His left arm was his drawing arm, but that didn't stop him. He would have to relearn to draw with his right, and after returning to Japan, he briefly attended classes at Musashino Art University of Tokyo. After the war, Mizuki worked a variety of odd jobs, including a stint as a kamishibai illustrator, which later proved to be a pivotal moment in his career. Before continuing, let me briefly explain what exactly a komishibai is. And now, for a reading from the Wheatster's Dictionary. Today's word is komishibai. Komishibai refers to a form of pictorial storytelling that largely emerged in the 1930s, but possibly has origins going back long before then. But... This is getting too thick into the weeds of things, and the history of Komishibai is worth a video of its own some other time. Anyway, Komishibai involves a storyteller, usually a candy vendor, interchanging illustrated cards in a wooden box, while narrating what is happening on the cards and telling a story with them. This form of storytelling became extremely popular in the early post-war period, resulting in a major industry forming around the creation of new komishibai illustrations, which Mizuki was a part of. Komishibai was so popular that series were even created and became icons, such as Golden Bat and Kitaro of the Graveyard. Remember this name for later. Komishibai's popularity waned, however, in the early 1950s, due to the increase in popularity of manga and television. And that concludes this week's reading of the Weepster's Dictionary. Soon, Mizuki entered into the rental manga market and published his first work in 1957 titled Rocket Man, which was essentially a ripoff of Superman. The majority of Mizuki's manga works are mostly horror stories, based off those folk tales and legends he heard as a child, as well as military manga, based on his experiences of the war. His military works were largely anti-war, intended to be autobiographical. As for his yokai stories, his most famous work and character was Kitaro. In 1960, he created his first Kitaro manga, titled... Hakaba Kitaro, which was an adaptation of the 1954 Komishibai story, but unfortunately, the manga sold poorly. In 1965, however, he reworked the story, creating Hakaba no Kitaro for Weekly Shonen Magazine, which proved to be a major hit, running until 1970. Kitaro would remain his most popular work, due in part to the number of anime adaptations that have come out over the years. Along with his more child-oriented works, Mizuki also created a large body of historical Gekia works, such as 1971's Adolf Hitler, A Biography, and a comprehensive autobiography titled Showa, A History of Japan, from 1988 to 1989. In the early 1970s, Mizuki revisited New Guinea, where he felt inspired to create a number of works, including 1973's Onward Towards Our Noble Deaths. He continued to create manga until the 80s and 90s, including a 1991 manga titled 
War in Japan, which dealt with the atrocities the Japanese military committed during World War II as a counterpoint to an increasingly prevalent revisionist narrative of the war in Japan. Mizuki continued to work up until his death in 2015. Mizuki is widely considered to be one of the greatest mangaka in Japan, and his characters and stories continue to be highly popular. So today, let's take a look at one of his many autobiographical works about the war. Onward Towards Our Noble Deaths is based on a true story about Mizuki's infantry unit on New Britain Island. The book opens with the troops at base camp getting ready to go into combat. They then ship out and take the beach without resistance and then spend the next couple of chapters setting up camp in preparation of the incoming U.S. invasion. Once the U.S. Marines arrive, the company's situation becomes dire due to the lack of supplies, support, and the declining health of the company. Out of desperation and searching for a glorious death in battle, Battalion Commander Tado Koro plans a suicide charge against the protest of the Division Commander, who thinks that they could retreat and engage in guerrilla warfare. Tado Koro doesn't believe this will work, however, and they undertake the charge, but in the confusion of the attack, a large number of soldiers survive. HQ of New Guinea catches wind about the charge, and they notify Japan that everyone has died before learning that a number have actually survived. The survivors then make their way to Cape St. George in order to regroup, while HQ, stuck in an awkward situation, deliberates as to what to do next. So, what will HQ do, and what will happen to the rest of the company? To find out, you're just going to have to read the manga for yourself. So, right off the bat, this manga is a fantastic secondary source, showing just how dire Japan's situation in New Guinea was, and the brutal conditions the soldiers lived in, whether it was starvation due to lack of supplies, contracting diseases due to the climate of the island, beatings from officers, and the impossible expectations the higher-ups had on the army. It's the focus on the experience of the common foot soldier that cements this manga as a great secondary source. Getting into the art, I loved the overall style of the manga. I love how the caricature look of the characters clashes against the highly realistic backgrounds and objects. Mizuki would, however, make the characters look realistic during impactful moments within the manga, which was a really nice touch. Getting back into the character designs, I mentioned that they had a caricature look to them. I think that this works wonderfully within the manga. It allows Mizuki to show what the characters were like within the story, just with their designs. Take Battalion Commander Todakoro, for instance. His design is great. He has this crazed look in his eyes, which fits perfectly with his characterization within the story. He is this rash and slightly unhinged commander, and his design shows it. Another stylistic choice related to character designs comes in how Mizuki keeps the enemy forces hidden and vague from the reader, minus a few moments. It's a deliberate choice that is also found in a number of other World War II narratives told from the perspective of Japan. This is done within the manga in part to highlight how the real enemies to the soldiers in the manga are the commanders who abuse them and force them into doing these suicide charges even when there are alternatives that could be taken. Getting into the composition of the manga, it is solid. One thing that Mizuki does in terms of composition that I like is that he will include these extremely impactful close-up shots that are highly dramatic and just highlight the ugliness of war. Mizuki also highlights the ugliness and horrendousness of war 
by using these intense, realistic, and highly stylized shots of death, gore, and destruction. The final couple of pages especially highlights the stylization. In general, the manga is just filled with these incredibly powerful shots. Take these for instance, they are so interesting to look at. His use of shading makes them stand out, and he just puts so much time and effort into them. Throughout the manga, Mizuki puts so much time and attention into crafting these amazing images, especially in terms of showing destruction and nature. Nature is another major aspect of this manga. The manga is full of these stunning shots of nature that I loved seeing. Mizuki noted how beautiful New Guinea was when he revisited the island in the 1970s, so that probably influenced his decision to include so many shots of nature within the manga. The single page and double page shots of the natural landscapes of the island is so beautiful and complex that I love it. Moving on to the story, it is a powerful anti-war manga that perfectly gets its point across with its realism and brutality. The manga is good at showing how the Imperial Army brutalized its soldiers. For instance, we see that there is a clear pecking order within the army, with the new recruits getting the worst treatment, not just from the COs, but even the older soldiers. The manga is also great at showing just how much of a mess the Imperial Army was. He depicts how the soldiers face supply shortages, forcing them to forage for food. He shows them contracting diseases and the overall low morale the soldiers had. The soldiers would have discussions within the manga about just how pointless the war felt to them and the sanctity of life, adding to the manga's overall anti-war message. Mizuki is also great at showing just how hectic and confused the fighting was, especially during the suicide charge. Finally, he is just so great at crafting these incredibly powerful moments in the story, such as the captain's death or the death of the last man that helped to make this such an amazing anti-war manga. Looking at the characters of the manga, the soldiers were highly realistic. They were quite frankly pretty nasty, and the way that they would talk to one another added to the realism. They could also be flawed, once again making them feel realistic. We see Sergeant Honda, for instance, being both incredibly cruel to the new recruits, and yet compassionate to them as well. Now, one point I wanted to mention that relates to the characters comes from one of the messages of the manga, which is that the CEOs of the Imperial Army were incompetent butchers, but interestingly enough, Mizuki did include a few level-headed officers that made for a great addition to the manga because it helped to make what ultimately happened to the company all the more brutal. One final note related to the story that I wanted to mention is that I loved how Mizuki incorporated music into the story. It's an element that can give even more power to a particular moment or scene, such as the song sung before the final charge. This is just such a brutal and realistic work, such a great document of the complete disaster that was the Imperial Army in the later stages of the war. Overall, the manga had fantastic art mixed with incredible shots which helped to make this a powerful work. There are some truly fantastic shots of nature, as well as brutality, highlighting how ugly war is. There are no bars held in depicting the ugliness of war. The only little problem I had with this manga has to do with the fact that we don't really spend too much time with one character. There are a ton of characters that we end up hopping around between, which makes it hard for the reader to latch on to a particular individual. Now, this may not actually even be a negative thing, 
because it results in us identifying with a group more so than just one person, making the deaths in the manga feel all the worse. This is an absolutely fantastic anti-war piece, and that's why I'm going to be giving Onward Towards Our Noble Deaths by Shigeru Mizuki a 9 out of 10. And that's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you agreed with what I had to say about Onward Towards Our Noble Deaths by Shigeru Mizuki. This is an incredibly powerful anti-war manga. And is an absolute must read for anyone to see just how horrendous war actually is. Definitely check this one out. Anyway, I hope to see you on this channel again real soon. Goodbye.